This is the Flabbergasted Podcast, where we just can't believe you haven't seen it. Every episode, we discuss a movie that one of us has seen and the other hasn't. Follow us on Instagram at FlabberPod and subscribe in your podcast app of choice. I'm your host, Jessica. Let's get to it. So today we're discussing Monuments Men. This is a film directed by George Clooney that came out in 2014. It was about two hours long. It's not available for streaming anywhere, so you have to rent it. Unless you have stars. It's an unlikely World War II platoon is tasked to rescue art masterpieces from German thieves and return them to their owners. I give that synopsis a thumbs up. I would say it is accurate. Accurate representation of the film that I watched. So I don't remember if I saw this in a movie theater. I feel like, nope, I really can't say one way or the other, but... I did like it enough and uh, Jared liked it enough that we purchased it. On Blu-ray and DVD VHS? On Apple. Okay, on Apple. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that it was quite old enough for the Blu-ray. Um, but I, what I liked about it is, without getting too deep here, I liked that there was, it was based on a true story, and that there was this recognition that these art masterpieces were worth saving in a time of war. Mm-hmm. So I appreciate that about it. What did you think? Like when we talked about different movies, so this is the second movie in our George Clooney set. Yep. He was also in fantastic Mr. Fox. Mm-hmm. And that's why we picked these as like companion films. What Rogie were your expectations going into it? I did not have a lot of expectations, honestly. So this came out in 2014. That's the year that I, Graduated college, got married, and started teaching middle school and coaching football, a sport that I never played in organized so fashion. Movie is not really on your so mind. So I was not going. I did. I guess that's not fair. I did go and see several movies that year. Um, we we did a movies Tuesday. We would just go to the theater and then say, "Well, but I haven't seen this." And we we walked into the Robert Downey Jr. movie where he's a lawyer. Mm, and his judge. dad dies. It's called The Judge or something like that, yeah. And Big Hero 6. And there's just a few movies I never would have seen normally that we did see that year. But this one just didn't, it wasn't on the radar. And it's never been, like we said, readily available on streaming or anything. I like a lot of the cast. I always have liked a lot of those actors. So not something I've avoided, but it's not part of a series that would hook me or there's, there's just been no reason to come back to it. So going into when we picked this movie, Mm -hmm. did you have like, did you know anything about it? I am sure that I saw a trailer at some point 10 years ago. I had a vague knowledge that some, that there would, there was a true story that this could be based on, that there was some kind of effort made to, save or salvage um, classic artworks during the World War II time period. I, despite being a history major, like not a huge World War II buff specifically, you know, a lot of high school history teachers or people like that that you'll talk to or like know all about the different battles. Like that's like why they like history. And that's just not the case for me. I don't so want to get I wasn't crazy super, here, but yeah. I don't think we covered like in my high school history thing, mm-hmm. you were talking about, there's a lot of different things yeah. that talked about the battles and everything, mm-hmm. but this whole concept of, art being stolen Mm -hmm. and I don't think that was ever really something that we talked about specifically we we covered a little bit about art um not art but just possessions in general being taken from Jewish people for the holocaust type stuff going on when we discussed that we didn't really talk about it in a way coming from an art perspective yeah yeah I mean AP U.S. history, we didn't even get to World War II, I don't think. Like, uh, you know, you're just spending a lot of time in the Civil War and the Revolutionary and just kind of don't always get all the way up there. And then in college, I didn't do anything specifically on that. We were much broader picture, like talking about the ethics of uh, inflation and and nuclear power and some things like that. So it's just, it's not, 
something that I've ever specifically been able to dabble in. It almost reminds me the closest thing I can think of would be like an Indiana Jones type of thing where you've got the Nazis that are in, you know, really interested in like things maybe off the beaten path, supernatural adjacent, which is different from art, but it's still not like just strictly, you know, this, there was a lot of Holocaust allusions and undertones and references in this movie. didn't shy away from it, but it wasn't, this movie wasn't about Auschwitz and Dachau and like about the, the mechanics of the Holocaust happening, you know, like a boy in striped pajamas or something would be. So similarly, that's kind of like, if I'm going to connect this to Indiana Jones, which also wasn't like, a, you know, it is about Nazism and like they're racing against them to try to get the same thing. So that's about yeah. as close as I can probably compare yeah. it. I didn't even, even think about that, but yeah. Yeah. You like it. The first scene is like late 1942 or early 1943 or something like that. At which point you're never really worried that the allies are going to win like the battle. Like that's not part of this movie where they're like, Oh, it's touch and go. The Germans are scoring military victories. They just keep marching closer and getting closer to Germany. Um, So it's not hanging. That part's not hanging in the balance. It's just the, fragility of these works of art. I mean, that can so easily be smashed or burnt or whatever that they're like, time is of the essence to get to it. Yeah. Yeah. Collateral damage, but even sometimes intentionally, I mean, they just were openly, they burned all the Picassos and stuff. Like, Yeah. And that's true because he was specifically, according to this film, and I can't give you like for real history, I don't know how much was changed, Mm -hmm. you know, to make it You didn't watch a documentary about Monuments Man in preparation for this podcast, Jess? (laughs) Um, according to the movie, he's going out to find these pieces to collect them himself to fill Stokes. the Fuhrer museum. Oh, okay. Hitler is. Yeah, Hitler. I thought you were talking Sorry. about George Clooney. And yes. I was like, no, I think my bad. <laughs> I think he was a little more selfless than that. It was kind of my interpretation of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, cause that connects to like the, everyone knows about Hitler, like studying art and like being enraged by the Jewish professors that didn't, weren't like super complimentary of him when he was in art school and things like that. So they brought that in for mm-hmm. sure, which was relatable. Yeah. So We've notable scenes for you. What, oh man, what do you got? Let me just pull I will up the bring old... up one of my first things is when George Clooney recruits Matt Damon and they are sitting really? at the bar okay. eating is very reminiscent to Ocean's Eleven mm-hmm. when Getting the George gang Clooney together. is yeah. sitting at the bar eating with mm-hmm. Brad Pitt. Mm-hmm. So I just, I immediately drew that because, right, two of the same actors in the same movie, but yeah. I didn't get necessarily super drawn in by any of that montage just because I feel like if I'd focus on that too much, then I would just be like, why am I not watching Ocean's Eleven, you know, <laughs> yes. which is one of my favorite movies. Um, I've seen the old one too and it doesn't hold up quite as well. I agree. Um, Really the very first scene, maybe pre title screen where they are putting away, the monks are like trying to hide away the, the that art piece, panel. the altar or whatever yes. it's called. Um, I was like, that was affecting. Like they seemed so sad. I thought those, that, that uh, acting did a good job of like setting the stakes that, you know, you didn't come in. It wasn't, the Mona Lisa, right? It wasn't something that I would have already been super familiar with or Guernica or whatever. Um, it was just some Catholic looking art that just from their mannerisms, I could tell, you know, you can just tell, okay, this is going to be really important. Like this is something that's very meaningful to them. So I thought they did a good job of setting the stakes at that point, just from the very beginning. I agree. I also liked, this was a kind of a, a double take for me that I didn't, I don't remember how early it is, but the scene with Kate Blanchett, who mm-hmm. I didn't realize was her until like a few seconds. And I'm like, wait a second. Yeah. Who, who I really like a lot of her other movies too. And I think mm-hmm. she's a good actress. Lord of the Rings, right? Smart. <laughs> yeah, she's I mean, Galadriel. She was Galadriel. What do you want She was, me? yes. But she's done other movies. Uh. Um, and I also, I thought it was a kind of... Um, gutsy of her to spit in mm-hmm. the glass, which I super appreciated too. And the fact that she offered it to the other girl that was in there, like you can spit in here too, if you want. Like, it's nice to establish that like a French artist in Vichy, France, you like, let's be clear. Like she's, she's against them. Like she's not yes. just totally, um, what's what I'm looking for. That is the word that they use. It's not just a description. It's like actually what it's called. Um, a collaborator. She's not just totally 
you know, shilling out to to hang out with them. She like is still against them, is trying to work against them. From and the she's not passive about it either. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, I, I appreciated that. And I thought that was fun because I don't know. She's taking a stand in, in some way, however mm -hmm. small it might be. Mm -hmm. She is taking a stand. Mm -hmm. Well, and we learn later on that she's been doing more than just that. Yes. But yeah, mm -hmm. it's a good, the, the Cable Inches storyline is a slow burn. Oh yeah. It is a slow burn. Um, and I was, I was the, the first time I saw it. And even this time I was like, oh, don't get sketchy on me. Like, don't. Uh, Where well, she tries to seduce Matt Damon. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, don't, don't get like, yeah. I get it. You're I mean, lonely. And we've all been war. there with Matt Damon. It's Paris. Yeah. And then I'm like, don't, 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 just don't do it. And then. I thought he was going to be like, man, okay. Yeah, you're right. We're right? in Paris. You have that minute yeah. where you're kind of thinking it. And then, then it's great. And I just, yeah. I love that. Cause I think that that is the storyline of the art is rising above the drama. The human base instincts. Yeah. 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 I did have a note about the getting the team together montage that I did not realize I had. Um, I was, I'll admit, I was a little confused by it. I was like, okay, we're starting the movie and now just no pushback on this plan. Like the president's into it and all six people they called were immediately into it. They were like, Which yep, I we're your friends. Yep, we're your friends. I, I'm just used to there being a little more tension, a little uh, having to convince someone to come out of retirement or what's in it for me. Like they they were like, that is not what the stakes are in this movie. Everyone loves art because it's yes. art and it's not about like people's personal like vendettas about one another. Like they did a little bit of the Hugh Bonneville's character who like had a drinking problem for some reason. And then it was like not quite enough to make me fully understand what was going on with that. But besides that, it was just like war sucks and like, we don't want this art destroyed. And Bill Murray and the other guy were a little, they were, they, they were, were kind just of goofy too. Yeah. They were goofy. And like, I mean, they had, don't get me wrong. They had like personality and stuff, yes. but there, it wasn't the stakes of the movie had nothing to do with like tensions between those characters. Yeah. Like Which you might see in other. I loved that because yeah. again, it talked to me. It's like they all understood the stakes of what they were trying to mm -hmm. do, which is by the way, if we didn't cover it really well was mm -hmm. to save these art pieces to save the art. from being lost to history. Not going to save itself. The thing that I love about that is they knew what they were doing, but the people fighting the war also that's where the tension was mm -hmm. like, no, you can't have any of my men. I'm not going to write a letter home to their mom saying, you know, they died trying to save this piece of artwork or whatever. Yeah. So that's where the tension was because they didn't, I don't want to say they didn't understand the importance, but George Clooney and crew got to have the luxury of understanding the importance of the art because other people were fighting the battle yeah. for people. Yeah, they just had different mathematical equations they were doing about the value of the human life. I mean, even at the end with the president, where he's like, are you serious? We lost one, you know, even if we'd lost one life getting this, what, piece of art back, is that worth it? And Joe Clooney's like, yes. I, are you kidding me, dude? Like, absolutely. He would definitely have said it yeah. was. I mean, and he did die for it. Like, mm -hmm. he could have run, he could have hid. Yeah, he he had no, there was no reason for him to do, the, do it the way he did it, yeah. I wrote down, like, that... Over the course of the film, you see like different people coming together to try to save the art. And I wrote down that I appreciate that even though not everybody is from the same culture, mm -hmm. they appreciate the cultural significance of the art. Because the one guy says, and it might be the guy that died, and I don't, see, I didn't do really great because I didn't remember their names, but he's in the, um, in the church and the guy asks mm -hmm. if he's Catholic and he says, I am, I am tonight. I yeah. am tonight. And I thought that's letting something bigger than maybe your personal differences be important to you, which is something that just resonates with me as a person. Yeah. Which maybe is getting a little deep for this podcast, but episode two, I think, I think that you can find deep things in movies that maybe they aren't even trying to say. Sure. So. Yeah. I mean, a good movie is going to, speak to the human condition at a level that isn't just like the most surfacey way possible. I think for sure. Yeah. Um, I liked the pace of the movie. Honestly, I was, you know, you just never know with a war type of setting I'm going into. It. I don't know what's going on. Um, 
they were, I wrote down that they were in mainland Europe 16 minutes in. Like, this is great. Like, I've got John Goodman's here and Bill Murray's here and the people I wanted to see. And we're not like waiting around. We didn't have a bunch of basic training montages or anything to deal with. We just kind of got right to it. And so I did appreciate that. I do love when they stop to see John Goodman at, at basic train. He, mm-hmm. like, he's in the little. Um, barbed wire trench thing yeah. and he just stands right up and he crosses over and he's like mm-hmm. hey and they're like, shooting blanks <laughs> yeah and then they're like uh no they're not which yeah. I don't actually know if they were or if they were just messing with him but right. it was a funny bit yeah Um, I, it was around that point that I got the sense that this was a movie that was mostly just going to be Clooney and Damon doing Clooney and Damon things like they were just kind of playing George Clooney and Matt yeah. Damon like I mean Ocean's Eleven is an easy touchstone with both of them in it um, and I liked that about it. I was like, that's great. Like George Clooney probably appreciates art in real life. Like this, it's not disbelievable. I don't have to think of him as Stokes or whatever, you know, to give him different motivations because of, you know, different reasons. Like he's just there. I mean, it's very black and white. Like the Nazis are bad guys. Like that's easy. You know, you've got me on that. Um, John Goodman was just being John Goodman. Bill Murray was just being Bill Murray. Um, just guys being dudes who love art. Mm-hmm. I like the scene where Bill Murray and the other guy who I recognize, I can't remember his name, are in um, the, uh, Bob they're, Balaban. They're opening their care packages mm-hmm. and he's got like cheese and I don't remember saltines. the other thing. Saltines, yeah. but like these sort of like luxury food items yeah. for being in the middle of a war. Mm-hmm. And I just thought that was kind of fun because it's like this you can appreciate like fine art and fine food and they're doing that in as many areas as they can. I just thought it was fun. Yeah. The movie is going out of its way to be like, these aren't just your average privates. Like these are guys who are in this to do this specialized task. Of course, those are the kinds of people that are going to, you know, appreciate the finer things like you're saying in ways that aren't just like haute, like art, like what would be quote unquote fine art. Which, I mean, it's not really quote unquote, like, I mean, they're talking about the Madonna and like, I mean, those are like the Mona Lisa fine art pieces. Yeah. One of the funny bits that I recognize, which I forgot we were going to talk about bits, but I always love it. It's one of our bits. Yeah. In a movie when somebody's standing there and people are talking in a different language and oops, you speak the language too. Mm -hmm. So you know exactly what they were saying. I always love that. So I really appreciated that scene when. The guy who Epstein, yeah, I think, yeah, could speak. Were they speaking German? Or were they, they speaking, were speaking German? German? Yeah, yeah. I would almost call that a trope, or like, yes, a, for sure. Yeah, something that they do because it didn't like come up a bunch more times. But that guy was one of my favorite characters because he was like, yeah, I was just like this eighteen-year-old dude that's here. Oh, George Clooney and Matt Damon want me to drive him around everywhere. I and speak German. I guess him. I'll do that. Yeah, because George Clooney's like, hey, hey, where you been? What are you doing? Yeah, because he. He picked them up like one time really early on and was like, and they were like, this is Epstein. He speaks German. And then the next time George Clooney he sees him, he's like, oh, you're one of the six people here I know. This is great. Like, let's yeah. do it. Yeah. I love it. And he was, he was just a bro. I kept waiting for there to be maybe a little bit of a turn, like when he found the gold or like those could be something. But he was just like, no, I'm just, I'm just here just being a bro. Like hashtag monuments, man. Like I'm just yeah. on the squad. Yeah. He was all so, about it. The other bit that I remember, and this only happened twice. And I will miss the first one, but some dialogue happens with George Clooney and then Matt Damon's character goes, I did. Like he said this and he's like, I did. I did say that. Mm. And it happens a couple of times. And I thought that's kind of funny because it's just like, I don't know. It was just super cheesy the way they, they did it, but it was funny. That's real though. Like a couple of friends who are talking to an, a, a group and one of them is doing the talking. And the other one is like being just the background person. Like yeah. I do that with my friends sometimes like, no, I mean, he's not wrong yet. Like yeah. that is, that is how it went down. That kind of thing. Yeah. We're somewhat related to that. I had a question. Did the dialogue seem like almost very modern? I wrote like, is that how they talked in the forties? Like there was no part of it that was like, Hey, you gotta get these dames like over across the, like, you know, any kind of anachronisms, like anything that like placed it in the forties. It seemed like you took, you almost took oceans 11, George Cooley, Matt Damon, put them, those carried the same like cultural sensibility characters directly into there. The dialogue didn't 
seem anachronistic it to me. It didn't take me out of the movie, obviously, because mm-hmm. I didn't notice it at yeah. all. But now that you're saying it, I mm-hmm. like if I rewatched it, I would listen for that more. Yeah. Because I, I don't think you're wrong. Mm-hmm. Just like in a lot of the media that you see that's set back in those times, like you just notice they talk a little bit differently. They use their phrasing is different. You know, there's a lot of times there's less like cursing or whatever, which is like probably not necessarily not actually necessarily. representative of how it happened. I mean, I know that they say that if you read letters that GIs wrote back to their girlfriends or wives or whatever, they're always like super sexual and like horny and gross and stuff. And they, they used to do, you know, there's stuff you couldn't write. And so they would, they would say that they were coming from a city, but they actually weren't in that city. It was just that like, les like Lisbon meant to like, you know, lick it. Like, you know, like they would like, <laughs> there were like codes, code. code words. Yeah. But they were like, all like just for like sex acts that they were like wanting to do when they got back and stuff like that. It's like, Oh, people were horny back then too. <laughs> it's not just, everything wasn't just, it's a wonderful life. Um, have you seen, so Hugh Bonneville is the actor who fully sacrificed himself for the Madonna in Bruges, who just shoots the, who shoots the guy and like puts his arm in a sling. Um, this is the only role I've ever seen him in where he's like, where he's just like one of the guys like doing stuff. Cause that's the dad from Paddington. Uh, he's also in the- Downton Abbey, uh, Downton Abbey. Guy. yes. Those are the the roles I'm familiar with him in, and he's very much older and stately and serious. And he's not unserious in this one, but he's got a gun and he's going around and he's doing the stuff like he's on the same level as the other characters, like where they're all. It's kind of. I was like, this is different. I only know him from Downton Abbey. Yeah. I don't even know him from Paddington. Well, I've talk seen about Paddington. a movie that I'm going to make you watch. No, I mean I've Paddington seen it. Too? I've seen Paddington too oh, as well, yeah. but he, I don't recognize him from it. Yeah. And that's probably, I mean, so, so I don't, I'm not a good gauge I'm sorry, for Paddington's that. It's probably question too whimsical then. for you. I'm sure it's, a bear that can talk, get real. Um, I David, liked Paddington. Uh, Yates act director of Paddington and Paddington too. I'm still scrolling through here to see if I recognize him from anything else. Those are the only ones I've seen him in. I thought that this movie was not like, I wouldn't say gorgeous, but all of the sets that they were on, like all the different cities they went to and the like farmhouses that they stayed in. I thought it was very pretty. Like all of them were like very nice looking. Yes. Which makes me remember one of, I have two more favorite scenes, which okay. is ridiculous because not Great. every scene can be your favorite scene, but the farmhouse that they stop in, with the dentist, which I'm like, why, mm-hmm. why are we at a dentist? Okay, whatever. He hurt something in his tooth. Mm-hmm. And then there's that whole side scene, which the dentist's office is like in the back of the butcher, butcher shop. Yep. And the woman comes in and then she leaves. And I'm like, yeah. that's like, we really didn't need that, but it was kind of interesting. She's setting the stage. Yeah. Yeah. You can use the same tools, right? You can get a, your cleaver or yeah. whatever. But okay. So we go and see the dentist slash slash the dentist's butcher's nephew. Or nephew. Something. Yeah. And they're sitting at the table and the one guy is looking at all the art yeah. and then they sit down and he's like, Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. These whatever. Yeah. And then he, he says, says, does your wife speak English? Yeah. It's kind of the inverse of that trope from earlier. Yeah. And then he says how Hitler and the kids jump up mm-hmm. and I'm like, bam, gotcha. Yeah. Which I loved that because kids are not, Ooh, in my experience, kids are not, naturally deceitful, like manipulative. Like mm-hmm. they're, they have no idea what they're talking about. They, and they've been brainwashed to know that that's the response mm-hmm. you give. Especially in that situation. Yes. Like they clearly hadn't been, we'd call it, I'd call it coached or prepped. Like, okay, now if you say, I know normally you would say this, but like, make sure you don't like Such that kind better of terminology. You just had my, well, that's, that's way better. My, I spend my days interviewing children and trying to determine if they're giving me sincere answers and stuff. Yes. So yeah, that's, Mm-hmm. So, yeah, but I loved that. And then what I thought was interesting is they don't kill him, which they don't kill anybody mm-hmm. unless I don't think they killed anybody. I don't anybody. think they kill, they shoot at a child at one point what, on accident. Because they don't know he's a yeah. kid. And then they find out he's a kid and they're like, what the heck? Gosh, dang it. Yeah. yeah. So I appreciate that they didn't kill him. Yeah. But I also am like, he got his. Mm-hmm. So... I don't know. I just thought that whole thing was very fun. And I think 
this sort of goes along the lines of them returning the art. Yeah. And um, Kate Blanchett's character is so, Mm -hmm. she's honestly worried, Mm -hmm. are they going to return it? And I think she's right. Like, she's very guarded with all this information that she has. And her primary concern is, Matt Damon's just saying, he's James. James is just saying he's there to help and he wants to return the art. Mm -hmm. But he has done nothing to earn that trust. How do you prove that? You you can't. Yeah. Until the article comes out and then she thaws a little bit. But that's the whole idea. Because the Russians are doing exactly that. They're doing exactly what she's worried that yes. Damon was going to do. Yeah. So I, I really liked that whole thing. And I really liked that the noble cause is returning the art, mm-hmm. preserving it and returning it mm-hmm. as much as they can. And I think like you hear or you see that like this is something that I've seen in movies and TV shows people noticing a piece of art and it's really part of their family history that was stolen at one point. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you do what you can to to return it to the rightful owner. And I think that that's a beautiful thing. And I think as a person or as a family who, you know, if you have all this heritage that was, you were robbed of, like, I just think there's a very sentimental and thing happening there. When I connect it to like, the Middle Eastern and, and Northern African countries that had all of their artifacts pillaged by the French and British. I mean, the Smithsonian or not the Smithsonian, but the, the big museums in Paris and like the historical museums in London, things like that are full of uh, Pharaoh headdresses and these things that are like, well, you have that because you did expeditions into Egypt and just took all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And like, there's a modern movement to, like, oh, there's stuff kind of, there's temples, these things like, you know, culturally should be, that's where they should be and some of that kind of stuff. But it's definitely the noble thing to do is just like give it back and like restore. It's more about restoration than it yes. is like enriching themselves or anything like that. Um, I wasn't aware it was a true story. I had that written down. I wrote, I have a whole note. I'm glad they found the art. I'm yeah. glad they found it. Yeah, it was good sure. that they found it. Well, especially the Madonna, mm-hmm. which is the specific scene that I remember when Matt Damon, James says, I love that George Clooney's like, we got to get this. We, and he's like, help me push this cart. And Matt Damon's like, no, we have to leave. We have to leave. And he's like, no, help me push this. And yeah. he comes around the corner and he's like, holy Yeah. Shit. And then Ooh. the other two guys catch up. Same thing. Same thing. And mm-hmm. he goes, that's what James said. And yeah. he's like, he I just did. said that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I did say it. That's true. Um, I loved John Goodman in this movie. He's not in it that much, but he's just, again, just being John Goodman, like just chewing the scenery and making you like him. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I thought he did a good job. Like when he notices that they're about to be caught in the middle of a like firefight and you can just see that on his face, Matt, he does this thing where when he's just like has a normal, like his resting face. He has a gigantic, like cartoonish frown. Like he has such a big man with such a big head that his features are almost exaggerated. And his mouth is like so big and long when he's at the funeral, that mm-hmm. very last shot of him, he's going, you can't see him at all, but like, I'm trying to <laughs> frown in a way that is like not natural, but just, he just looks like he's two mountain men. Like he could, yeah. <laughs> like he could just rip somebody apart with his bare hands. That scene, by the way, was, Mm-hmm. Just freaky. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, that one's freaky. Because he's just how oblivious he is, which yeah. not in a mean way, because I that would have been me. I would have not recognized until they were right there in front of my face. Yeah. He had no way of knowing. Yeah, he was just excited about the horse, which is, is human for sure. Which kind of surprised me that the horse would have been there anyways, mm-hmm. just because it wouldn't have gotten scared off already kind of thing. But mm-hmm. anyways. So I'll be honest, the Kate Blanchett, I have... <laughs> There were times I was like, oh, right, there's a Kate Blanchett storyline. Like, that's happening, too. It was too slow for me. Like, there wasn't enough. It was obvious where it was going, and there wasn't any, like, push and pull about it. It was just every scene was Matt Damon being like, no, really, you got to give me a chance. I'm a good guy. We're trying to figure it out. And her saying, I don't trust you. And then we'd go away, and we'd come back, and she'd be like, I'm trusting you a little more, but I don't trust you yet. And I think my my broader issue with the movie is that it's especially our, our monument men guys, those characters were just all gas, no breaks, just good dudes saving art. And so yeah. then uh, they'd find some art and it's like, okay, when we get into the next art they're finding. So there wasn't, 
you know, eventually, you know, you're just on the downhill of a roller coaster. You're like, I know where we're going. Like, we're just getting the art. And so, like, how, like, why am I supposed to care about this Kate Blanchett storyline? You know, I don't really think that they're going to fall in love necessarily, which is maybe something that could, that could grab you. But the pacing for that stuff wasn't, wasn't my favorite. That would be my biggest complaint. I think I'm not a spy. Let me just throw that out there. But I imagine well, if you're going, a spy would say. if you're going to turn an asset, it doesn't necessarily take one day. Yeah. So he had to put in the time. Right. But, but I don't disagree that it's, it's kind a of movie. like a slow yeah. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. Yeah. I buy it that. just wasn't like, you know, when she brought out that she had a book and she had been in the resistance and she'd been keeping track of her, I wasn't like, whoa, the payoff from this storyline. Like, oh, I, you know, it yeah, wasn't yeah, yeah. like, you know. It, it wasn't adding and much to them, like to make me like be just really invested in the movie, if that makes sense. And like none of them were necessarily the things that really got me invested were John Goodman, like trying to nurse the French guy like back to life and like, you know, trying to keep him alive. That stuff where it like touches on death, you know, Hugh Bonneville sacrificing himself for it just straight up. Um, the I did really like the Nazi interrogation scene at the end that George Clooney did. Um, we'll get to mem- most memorable scenes I think here in a little bit. Um, so the when when you did have tension like with a person, thought that was good, and that's kind of just a historical drama is what it is. Like, mm-hmm. I know the allies are going to win, you know, like they're just, it wasn't even trying to have tension with some of that stuff. I know they're going to get the art. Like they're not, this, this film doesn't exist in a version that they don't end up getting, you know, finding right. it. So that's a little bit of my cynicism. Um, not being able to suspend, you know, disbelief and being like, okay, let's see what happens. Kind Do you of think thing. it would have resonated if they had written in an art piece that they, well, I mean, they did write an art. They weren't able to save. Because he picks up that Picasso frame. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right at the end when he's telling the president, like, I want to go back and look for this um, Rembrandt or whatever it was that we, I recognized it from earlier, like they had torched it. Because that was one of the ones they lingered on when they were doing mm-hmm. the torching and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, you can't get everything. And I appreciated that part of it, too. Um, the, it the, made me sad, just, yeah. honestly, when yeah. I was watching it. Oh, yeah. And I'm not even it a was huge affecting. art person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've been, like, I try to go to those museums when I'm in the big cities and I, I'm kind of kicking around the museum for an hour and end up leaving. Like I don't have the appreciation for it. Like academically, I just don't know what I'm looking at well enough, but it was definitely, I would say affecting is a good word. Like you cared definitely, yeah. but I cared a little more about, like the death stakes, like when they, on Christmas day, when they pick up the guy from the side of the road and are just trying to save him, those kinds of things I think really hit. I do recognize, and I, the Kate Blanchett storyline, I will recognize that it's kind of slow, mm-hmm. but I also recognize that they would not have found the castle right. without her information. Mm-hmm. And I want to appreciate that in this monuments men story of a bunch of male characters. Yes. There is a woman that brings something to the table. Absolutely. That is a strong character on her own without having the dependency of her. Yeah. Of a man with her. I don't think it passes the Bechdel test because she does talk to that other girl, but it is about Stahl, the German guy. So unfortunately. <laughs> I think off screen it might have. Yes. But there's some off page stuff. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. She had a rich inner life for sure. Um, they are smoking all the time. Yes. Which is a good anachronism. Period, like, right? yeah. That's put in in the forties and that's good. But w- I mean, they're like picking, they've got a cigarette hanging out of their mouth, picking up like these huge, like when they're at the castle, especially I'm like, geez, dude, yeah. like you'd think you not from a health benefit standpoint, but like getting smoke. From an on art the preservation. Yeah, that's kind of your whole deal. Yeah. It's like what the whole movie is about. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was funny. I mean, it didn't take me out of anything. I just thought it was funny. Um, is there anything else you wanted to make sure we for definitely hit? I'm good with best and worst performances. I have a couple just real quick hitters. Um, I liked the landline scene. That was a surprise to me. I thought we were in the denouement. I thought we were coasting and I really thought that he might've died there. Like I I could have seen that he would have died. And so that's one of my impacted me most notable. Like I think that's the one I remember the most and have, I enjoyed the most because 
he calls Stokes in mm-hmm. and then he's like, well, let's get the other guys in. They're like, what are, what are they going to do? And he's <laughs> like, well, you know, they have an architecture background, you know, and yeah, like engineering kind of side. And so I guess for me, I liked this idea that they're putting practical use out of their knowledge, right. In an actual sure. situation, which mm-hmm. I thought was fun. Mm-hmm. I didn't necessarily care that they all wanted to stay. I thought that was stupid. I I respect yeah, it from a, right. we don't want you to die alone if we think you're going to die. Mm-hmm. But at That's the same how time, soldiering works. you still have a job to do. Mm-hmm. And if you all die here, no one's going to help finish off mm-hmm. everything you need to finish off. So I was a little conflicted there, but I did kind of wonder the first time I saw it, if he was going to die because we'd already yeah. lost two. Right. So it wouldn't have been unbelievable. Shocking, yeah. The that scene when you were saying that like he called them in, they were talking about them being architect. It reminds me a little bit of almost like a Gilmore Girls, like just this rapid, um, just boom, boom, boom yes, dialogue that dialogue. they're doing, um, which sometimes works better for me than others. I mean, sometimes it's like makes things it makes it a little bit trite, but in that case, I think it was just more like they do have that rapport. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've built that Damon and Clooney rapport um, into the, into the story for sure. But I love that in real life when I have a group of people or a person. Mm-hmm. You can just bang, bang, bang. Yes. Yeah. And it's one of my most favorite things. And I just feel so um, in sync with them and like mm-hmm. belonging. It's a really great feeling of belonging. And I'm sure I get endorphins from that, but it's really great. So I appreciate that when I see it. Yeah. on screen because it's not unrealistic, mm-hmm. but sometimes it can't Gilmore take you Girls out of the movie. Is. <laughs> well, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, this wasn't to that extent for yeah. sure. It's just what it kind of reminded me of. Um, I'm going to plant my flag here. The translator, Sam, he looks kind of like Pete Davidson, like a Jewish Pete Davidson. He had the eyes. He had like the sunken eyes with the, a little bit of circle around him. Uh, not Davidson enough for me away. to notice and recognize. No? Okay. But I won't disagree per se. Get in the comments, gang. Best performance for me, it came down, there was a good chunk of it where I thought I was going to give it to John Goodman. Though the word performance in any of these cases is almost a stretch for me because I'm like, he's just being John Goodman yeah. and he's definitely just being Bill Murray. Bill Murray hasn't played a role where he wasn't Bill Murray and I don't know how long. Um it was going to be John Goodman. And then when they had the Clooney and scene where he's interrogating, um, I wrote down the Nazi's name, uh, Wegner, um, the one who shot Hugh Bonneville when he's interrogating him. I thought that was good. And that brought over the fence for me over the, over the fence. That's not the phrase that took it over the finish line for me for, to give it to best performance to George Clooney. I don't disagree with that. I'll, I'll give that to you. Mm-hmm. I like that. Is that who you would have, you would pick? I mean, it was really hard for me to find somebody to set apart, but honestly, if you're talking about actors not being themselves, yeah. I would say Kate Blanchett because okay, sure. she was definitely she not. She has her French accent. Yeah. yeah. And she's being a very sort of, mm, I don't really want to say uptight character, but I kind of do want to say uptight character. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's, she has a lot of tension in her character. She's intentionally wound up like yes. in a, um, oh shoot. What's the paranoid way more yes. like reasonably so, right. right? She's living in Vichy, France. Yeah. So, I mean, if we're, if that's mm-hmm. a parameter of best performance, them not being them, mm-hmm. I would say she did an amazing job at that. Yep. I had her as an honorable mention along with, um, translator, Sam, um, P. Davidson. Yeah, Sam Pete Davidson. Yeah, mm-hmm. I like all of those guys. What about worst performance? Worst performance, um, I'm going to give to Stahl, the guy whose champagne she yes. spits into. It's not that his performance, I guess, was awful. It was just that, like, I didn't totally understand what that character was supposed to be doing for me. Like, he came, we had that, and then we had him coming to her apartment. I was like, okay, like, this is the villain of the Kate Blanchett storyline. And then, and then he five leaves. minutes later, he leaves. And I was like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this. And like, I, why I did you bring him into my life? I don't know why he didn't kill her yeah I mean, I mean, he, he shot at they, her from the train and then they but none of those bullets landed which also probably close. accurate to the 40s yeah and she I, I did like her just standing there like i know you're shooting at me i don't care like you're I not know, gonna hit me right taking yeah. another stand i love that mm-hmm. um yeah his character was very like i don't know without furthering along her storyline i don't know what he's there for it was similar to 
the dude they the Russian commander they wanted me to care about where they were like oh the Russians might get there first we don't know what's gonna happen and he didn't actually have any dialogue with anyone he just like flipped open a book and was like Hitler has art um, mm-hmm. and like I, I get that they they're, those were the stakes they were trying to put in there was like that race to the mine and stuff like that but it didn't it was it seemed a little a little overstuffed with those guys so I think this movie did hold up for me. Like okay. I remember liking it the first time I, mm-hmm. I saw it. I remember liking it when I watched it again. Mm-hmm. And the only thing I would say is like on my second rewatching, I felt like it was maybe a little slower, mm. but I don't necessarily think that it didn't fit the movie. Yeah. And yeah. So what it, mm-hmm. overall thumbs up, thumbs down. What do you think? Overall, um, I would say, that I enjoyed it. I didn't, I wasn't mad that I was watching it as it was happening. Um, I think I've kind of hit on why I enjoyed it. And it was more mostly because I felt like I was hanging out with George Clooney and Matt Damon and uh, Bill Murray and those guys. So that was good. Um, I don't know that I would plan on rewatching it because I would rather just watch Ocean's Eleven, I think, if I was going to watch, if like that's what I'm going for out of it. So I'll just watch Ocean's Eleven and be like, oh, I wish John Goodman was in this. <laughs> <laughs> and that would probably be my plan. Um, but it was, it was fun. Yeah. It was enjoyable. It was, it was a little, you know, I'd probably give it a seven out of 10 because there's, there's a little six and a half, maybe paint by numbers, just like these are the good guys. They're the Americans and they're doing the good guy things and war is sad. And there was it, 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 like a, another tablespoon of nuance somewhere in there might have been fun for me. If I really thought that one of them was going to try to pocket something or, you know, it was going to turn code on somebody. But mm-hmm. I just never really thought that at any point. So the stakes were a little low. But yeah, I enjoyed it. I, I would have really not liked it if they pocketed something or did something shady. Like I would have been really disappointed in a movie. <laughs> And in real life, perhaps. Yeah. Well, it'd be like that. Welcome to men disappointing you. <laughs> Get used to that. I don't know. Spoiler alert for the rest of your life. Yeah. Um, there were a couple um, tiny things that I forgot to say. Uh, the soundtrack, I was like noticing at the end, this is giving me Harry Potter vibes a little bit. It's one of the guys that did okay. it, the score for one of the, at least one of the Harry Potter movies. I think it was the fourth one, Alexander Desplat. I saw the name. I recognized it from Harry Potter World. So I liked that I was right about that. I also wanted to give honorable mention for worst performance to the kid who tried to shoot John Goodman, who just like stuck his hands up and just, just like giving crazy eyes. What I was, was like, that kid even you're doing? overdoing it a little bit. He was doing he, what he thought he was supposed to do, but... Like I don't from know. a history standpoint, is that realistic or do you think like a kid just happened along? Um, I think they were training, they were trying to do some child soldier stuff. Yeah. You know, even if your mom dies, like you got to continue to defend the motherland and, you know, training little kids how to hold the rifle and, you know, those are the bad guys. Those are the GIs and stuff. I think that's fairly realistic. I think it was interesting how often they found themselves in situations like that. Where they were like, I don't actually want to kill you. <laughs> well, where they were like not expecting to be in the middle of, yeah. I mean, maybe it might be naive to say they weren't expecting it, but it wasn't a part of their plan to be in the middle of mm-hmm. action and it found them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that was good. I mean, that's what I liked most about the film was those times that we went, we actually, okay, like something could happen here. Yeah. Like we're actually, you know, it's not just yeah, the fun, perfect American saving the day. It's like we're they're still in doing a difficult this situation. In the of a war. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Grounding it. Yeah. Really? Let's go. Okay. So, so it was George Clooney month. It was Alexander Desplat month. And Bill Murray was also in. Yeah. Fantastic he was in Fox. both of them. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay, it was definitely, I knew, I thought it was either the fourth one or it might have been the last two. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Little Women, Love Little Women. Wait, the 2019 Gret- Greta Gerwig one? Yeah, it's definitely that one. You're not talking about the 1996 one with Christian Bale <laughs> that I have not seen. I have seen Argo, Bonazio, Dark 30. It's a very different than Fantastic Life. Mr. Fox. Secret Life of Walter Mitty. That's not what that's called. It's a Fantastic Life of Walter Mitty. So you wouldn't watch it again, but you didn't not like it. 
Yeah, I would say that's accurate. I enjoyed the time that I spent watching it. Not a waste of almost two hours. No, not a waste. <laughs> George Clooney's beard was really nice. It was good. It was fun. I like to see Nazis get defeated. Yeah. So that concludes our... Alexander con- Desplat month. <laughs> our, our companion Mark. episode yeah. to our George Clooney, Alexander Desplat. Willem Dafoe. Willem Dafoe. <laughs> and uh, Bill Murray. And I think that 